right, well first, it is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, Ken Squire, because we're at the headquarters of WDEV. Radio Free Vermont. That's it, that's it. It is an honor. They're in the wall, Penny is sliding, slamming into the wall. Pearson is still running. Today, race cars capable of over 200 miles per hour take on a far more romantic image. This track, more than any other track, is fun. We're here at Brooklyn, Michigan this afternoon. I'm Ken Squire. 41 drivers are lined up for this, the most prestigious stock car race in the world. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. There's a fight. The tempers overflowing. This place, when I come in, it's been in your family for how many years? Well, Dad, 1930. We'll go back no. to that. Yeah, we'll go back to that in a minute. This place reminds me of the race shop that I grew up in Level Cross. It feels a little bit like home. It, and, it, and it really does. It really does. When I walked in, because it's just so eclectic, the way that you need it. That's a kind word. That's oh, a kind that's word. That's a kind word, right? Yeah. And, so, and I want to get into that before we start anything else. The lexicon, the words you brought to this sport. I, I, I've got a list here. Oh, this is bad. Yeah, these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things, common men doing uncommon things. The deeds. great um, deeds. The the great American race. I like. You can correct me on anything. Okay. The really? great American race. The the Alabama. I mean, so many things that you brought to what is now the next NASCAR lexicon. Um, where did that come from? Where did you learn that word lexicon? It, it was written down on this piece of paper by okay, someone other okay. than me. <laughs> well, well, presumably because uh, you know my dad was a, it was in the newspaper, but of course it was a weekly paper yeah. here, the Waterbury Record. About 1930 was when Mr. Whitehill, who owned it, said, "Lloyd, more people can hear than can read." I think we ought to look at radio. And here we are. So that was 1930-31. Yeah. Is, is when, you're, when yeah, your dad, yeah. when the radio station came along. You started early in radio. What was your progression? And I read where you called a race from the back of, a, of, of an old truck. Radio well, that, called a race. Excuse me, that, that was the judge's stand. Oh, the judge's stand. Yeah, it was a lumber truck. Okay. And uh, it was in Morrisville, Vermont. And in those days, uh, well, there were 23 tracks in Vermont. It was just like the Carolinas. Wow. And, <laughs> the, uh, and it became a battle of the north-south. Uh, the northern drivers, that would be Barry, Vermont, all of those granite workers. And then the south uh, was the rest of the state. It didn't last long. We had a riot there about the second month between the north and the south. and. Uh, the races ran so long in those days that the cops all went home. They were gone by six and by eight, you know, it was getting towards sunset. And uh, they got in a heck of a fight and the Morrisville Speedway disappeared. And they needed an announcer. And I think I got three or five dollars or whatever. I was 15. That pretty much is, is where yeah. it began. Well, no, that isn't true. My dad was a harness race guy, and so yes. we did all the country fairs. Okay. Then the big fairs would have a sprint car race or a midget race, a couple of superstars yeah. fr from the indie field. And then there'd be a bunch of ham and eggers that would run against them. And that was where I decided that I would spend the rest of my life. God, I love those cars. And uh, had to find a way to do it. Did you ever try driving? Oh, yeah. Oh, and try is a good word. Yeah, I tried. I tried for a number of years. Well, you asking. did. You did a method. <laughs> you did a Methodist job. I got halfway there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so what was? I mean, what did you do? How much racing did you do? A year or two. Then I got caught. Mother was not thrilled at all. Knew I'd get my teeth knocked out, which I did finally. <laughs> and that sort of changed things a bit. But because he was a announcer of standard bred horse racing. I got to hang around in the judges stand. And Chris Economaki yeah. showed up. And that was in the midst of World War II. It was just after World War II. Yeah. Yeah. So your basis when you started calling motorsports was really based in what your father had done. That's, that's fascinating to me. I learned so much from being around my grandfather, from being around my father. And one day I woke up and I was like, I know that. 
It's not that I, I thought I didn't know I was learning. You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. You, you, don't, you don't know you're learning, but one day you start doing what you do, and it's like, oh yeah, I've heard my grandfather talk about this, or I heard my dad, and this is what you do in this situation. Is that where you picked up the style of calling, the verbiage of what you used to to describe what was going on in the race? I track? thought I think a lot of it came off the midway. Okay. Because uh, what you did, if you worked those shows in the early days, was uh, you, you sold the show. Yeah. Economaki became <laughs> the singular voice. I was fascinated by him. Chris Economaki, you've always been close to racing, but you know, this is a bit ridiculous. Well, Jackie, I, everyone always wants to drive the winning car at Darlington, and now I've finally done it. And he really understood it, and he too started out to be a driver. I think he ran one race while well, I was in high school and everybody had a car, alleged, and uh, I was in Malice Bay, Vermont, and I thought that I was the next Indianapolis star. And I'd run a couple of heats, and a guy in a six-cylinder Plymouth. I went down into turn one, and I knew that no one had ever surpassed what I was doing in that corner. And this guy pulled up along beside and waved, and then went on. I said, well, maybe I gotta rethink all this. <laughs> 1950, you were 15. With each passing year, did motorsports become a bigger part of who Ken Squire was? Oh yeah, and I began to define what it was that was unique and special about this that I couldn't find in any kind of school sports, et cetera didn't work for me, but the first time you, you heard one of those sprint cars come down the main straightaway and the guy lifted, cranked the wheel the wrong way and power slid through that corner, that was something unique and special. And how you encapsulated that and convinced people that were watching that this was more than just people running around in circles. So each year, Ken Squire became more and more of what auto racing was, especially in this area. In 60, 61, right along in there, you start Thunder Road. You're 25 years old. Yeah. And now, now you have a track. Yeah, well, it, it was that business of, I really thought that I, I knew what I was doing. Of course I didn't. Yeah. But uh, there were three or four of us and, and we built a high bank quarter mile asphalt. And heretofore, in a place like Vermont, so uh, that was the growth of the whole sport, and it was packing them in, and, and that's what it did all over the nation. Thunder Valley was only the second asphalt track. Thunder Road. Thunder Road, excuse me, it was only the second. International Speed Bowl. Inter International Speed Bowl. High atop okay. Quarry Hill. <laughs> Still operating. Still operating. Still operating. Still operating. And, and, and I tell people Thunder Road may be the most famous racetrack that everybody knows about because of Ken Squire. Kind of you to say that. I question the validity of no, that. No, it's, it's valid. Oh, okay. It's valid. All right, I'll buy it. it. It is valid. Quarter mile, high banked. Who were the stars there when you started? Oh, oh, let's see. Well, uh, by that time, uh, the north-south battle had evaporated, and, and Barry, Vermont, which is the granite capital of the world, and all of those folks that worked in those quarries, that was their game. Yeah. So the flying Frenchman, Norman Chaloux, the Ingerson brothers from North Haverhill, New Hampshire, gave it an international flavor, you know, over the Connecticut River, and roll over Farnsworth. And it was alleged that he rolled it over something like 30 times in a year. And Chester T. Woods, T for tops, he had a tractor seat, just the seat part, nothing in the back. And he was the average, everyday, all-American guy that didn't have a lot of money, but he had a lot of ingenuity and a great deal of courage and had survived the war and he was ready for more. Again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump forward a little bit because I'm, I'm wondering how you found your way down south. How'd you end up in Daytona? Beats me, Captain. <laughs> I, just, I mean, did you just show up and knock on the door or had Bill France been up here no, and had Bob you Saul had been up okay, here. Okay, that's my question. And you know, he was one of the big stars of the Nutley Velodrome back in the yeah. 30s. So I got a chance to go down there and work one year, I think it was 64. Voila, here we are. <laughs> no way. And Big Bill was big on announcers. 
he really wanted somebody to sell the show, which was different than most of the announcing that was done and still is. Gets into all this technical stuff and who cares. But what they wanted were, were heroes, American heroes. And in the World War II, the genuine deal came home from the Pacific and the Atlantic, and they were our neighbors. And they didn't have a pot either, but they built race cars, and they went out and played, and they loved it. But it's part of what really was the fundamental basis for what Bill France put together and convinced America that we had a new major league sport. Tim, meet Bill France, president of NASCAR. It's nice to meet celebrities, but the only sights Tim really wants to see are automobiles. Well, almost the only sights. So you ended up in Daytona, 64. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right along in there. The first race you called, who were the guys in the, in, in the race? For sure, in a, that period of time, yeah. the Petties, and there were the others. There was Fireball, yep. there was Marvin Panch, who came over from California. What a super guy. And, and uh, the last American hero, Junior Johnson. And they all contributed something, and each one in a different manner. The green is about to be unfurled once again on the most competitive automobile racing in the world. But then in, in the late 60s, 69, right along in there, um, Motor Racing Network comes about. Yeah. And that well, is a, Talladega came along. Talladega came along. Talladega was, Talladega was, that era was a big era. And, and Talladega was what really changed. The restraints were off. It was faster than Daytona, scarier. Yeah, were you, in Daytona, were you in Talladega when the drivers all walked out? When future historians write about the wonders of the world, save at least one chapter for this. The world's fastest motor speedway, the Alabama International Motor Speedway, here at Talladega, Alabama. This fast, it's the fastest racetrack we've got. This is a different racetrack. It's different than, than anywhere in the world. It's a kind of a racetrack that uh, there's uh, really nothing but speed here. There was a lot of frightened race drivers. Mm -hmm. They were snapping off wheels. A lot of them said, no thanks. I think it was Leroy Yarbrough that said, Mr. France, I owe you everything I've got, but I'm not going to die for you. That, that was a general thought. Meanwhile, there were all these talks about new groups that were being fostered to build racetracks all over the super speedways. And uh, Darlington had been an experience for a long time. There's something about the design, something about the aura of Darlington that causes spectacular action. But a lot of promoters saw this as the next step to have a super speedway. And uh, France was willing to back up the motor racing network. And there I was down there. We had, a, we had an office in Daytona, which was the top of a Pepsi Cola cooler with one telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and I was all for that. I mean, I, I really thought that there was a piece of this that was bigger than just the stock cars running around. And it broke away from all of organized sport as we knew it. I'll go to that for a minute. You, you, you touched on it there. In the Southeast, we didn't have sports teams. We, we didn't have the NBA, the NFL. Well, you had college football. We had college football. At that time, Motor Racing Network brought those local heroes to more of a national audience. How much time did you spend at each racetrack during that period of time? As much as I could. Yeah. Because I found the people were so fascinating and they were so honest. Yeah. All of them, particularly in your family, or fearless Freddie Lorenzen from up in Elmhurst, Illinois, and those guys, they all got out there together and they laid it all on the line. And the society, in some ways, would make a freak show out of what they thought racing was. And they missed the point entirely that people could care that much. Fascinating that today, as racing has hit, hit a tipping point and we're deciding where we're going to go and what we're going to do, fascinating that now there, there's a whole new attitude. And I question if that's what we want to do because that kind of character is disappearing and it is couched in all kinds of language that doesn't mean much. 
that's a story unto itself. Yeah. Why would you want to do something that you know darn well could turn around and bite you, could kill you? I never wanted to do anything else. Why? If I was born in me, bred in me, I reckon. Hey, NASCAR fans, thanks for checking out the NBC Sports YouTube channel. Make sure you hit subscribe below for the latest NASCAR news, race highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.